so I should have said this for the prior panel. Um, we have uh, biographies of our speakers in uh, the materials. Um, so I'm not spending time, we have, we have precious few minutes here for each of our panels, so I'm not spending time giving elaborate introductions to our distinguished panelists. Uh, but um, I do want to direct you towards their biographies so you can see their rich backgrounds. Uh, our second panel uh, is going to focus on the interaction between the general legal needs of veterans um, uh, and the VA benefits. Uh, so, of course, veterans' legal needs transcend the, the benefits offered by the VA. Uh, and this panel is going to think about sort of meeting the more general need uh, of legal services for veterans. So uh, our, our panelists are Pete Kempner and Coco Cullen, who both do uh, work in this area. So, uh, so Pete's going to lead off. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me, Minor. It's really a, a pleasure to come and speak today uh, about our program and some of the issues that we see uh, in our Veterans Justice Project at Brooklyn Legal Services. Uh, Brooklyn Legal Services is part of Legal Services NYC. Um, and so just in the beginning here, I'm going to talk a little bit about our program and how we work um, and our Veterans Justice Project, how it came to be and how we work with other uh, legal providers uh, for veterans. Uh, and so Legal Services NYC is the largest provider of civil legal services in the nation. Um, and we have, veteran, we have offices in all five boroughs, uh, and we have Veterans Justice Projects in all five boroughs. Uh, and so our Veterans Justice Project, we provide free civil legal services to veterans, active duty service members, and their families. Um, and a, a huge focus of our work is actually housing. Um, and so a plurality of the cases, 40 some odd percent, and I think I have some graph later on um, showing the percentages exactly of, of, of where our cases lie, uh, but housing is a huge need. And frankly, housing is a huge need for all low-income New Yorkers. When you look at our practice generally, um, you know, that's always the, the most demand, uh, most in-demand civil legal services need for the community, and that translates into with our, our veterans clients as well. You know, the way legal services offices are generally set up is that we're set up by area of practice. So we have a housing unit and a social security unit and a family law unit and a tax clinic and a foreclosure prevention project and so on. Uh, and what's nice about the veterans project, uh, instead of focusing on an area of law, we focus on a population uh, and, and try to provide comprehensive legal services, civil legal services to that population. Um, in, in my former life, in my first decade at legal services, um, I actually was in our HIV unit, which is the same kind of approach uh, to providing services. So, you know, if a, a client comes to us presenting, um, you know, with a housing issue, then we try to look at the big picture and say, okay, do they have a benefits issue as well that could help solve the housing problem? Is there something going on uh, with their family life? Is there a, maybe a child support issue that's affecting their ability to pay the rent? And trying to take that holistic view. So. You know, when I started the Veterans Justice Project three years ago, I tried to translate that kind of general legal services approach that I had in our HIV practice to our veterans practice. You know, I think we've been fairly successful in that. Um, and, and so, you know, like I said before, housing is a huge focus. And, and um, you know, the fact that our clients are veterans usually doesn't make a big difference in housing court. Um, as far as you know, what are the legal issues and how we're going to represent them in the case, but but we have found that knowing that our clients are veterans makes a big difference in how we solve the problems. Uh, and so, for instance, you know there is a huge amount of resources out there um, for veterans for eviction prevention. There's a program called uh, Supportive Services for Veterans Families (SSVF). It's a grant program through the VA. They've contracted with seven local community-based organizations here in New York City who receive this money and they have eviction prevention funds. And so, you know, if a veteran is facing eviction for non-payment of rent, they could pay up to five months worth of rent arrears. Um, they also have rehousing funds. 
So if a veteran is facing eviction, they, they can't solve the problem, maybe it's a no defense holdover or something else like that going on with the housing, but they found alternative housing, they don't have the money for a security deposit, first month's rent, um, you know, broker's fees, that kind of thing, these SSVF programs are there and will pay those funds. And so it's funny, last night, we, or yesterday afternoon, we just had an event over our, our main office in Manhattan, uh, a CLE, which was Christine Clemens, who's a colleague of Nancy Morgan, taught with me um, about why we should ask the question, is somebody a veteran? And I think they alluded to this on, an early, on the earlier panel about how important it is to, to know whether your client's a veteran. And something was said, I think, about you know, if somebody's coming to you for a social security issue, you ask them, are you a veteran? Um, and maybe that means they will be eligible for service-connected disability benefits or a VA pension or whatever it is. You know, I, I've found the same thing translates into almost all areas of, of, of law that we practice in uh, because there are these resources out there. Um, there are some certain special protections out there. Um, and so uh, we always ask the question, and, and there was a conversation yesterday about how do you ask the question, right? And I think, frankly, just asking, are you a veteran, is not necessarily the right question to ask because for certain people, veteran has very specific connotations of, well, that means that I, was, I had combat duty and I served overseas and maybe I you know, never left stateside or maybe even I did, I never saw combat. Um, and, you know, or somebody, you know, maybe was in JAG and they don't feel like, you know, they have that same um, level of service as somebody who was in combat overseas. Um, and so what we tend to try to ask is, have you served in the military? And, and frankly, we don't limit it to just, have you served in the military? We ask, have you or has any member of your household served in the military or is currently serving in the military? Because frankly, if you have somebody who has current military service, if somebody is out of the household because they're on active duty, well, then there's a whole host of protections that could come up related to that as well. Things like the Service Member Civil Relief Act, uh, the New York State Sales and Soldiers Civil Relief Act. Um, and so it's a really important question to ask. You know, in, in our, in, in legal services, it's a question that we didn't ask for a very long time. And it's a question that we have now for the last few years been starting to ask. And, and it's made a tremendous difference. Um, in the lives of our clients because now we're able to um, access resources and make arguments that we might have missed before. And so I think it's a really important uh, question for us as attorneys to ask of our clients. Um, so we do housing, um, getting back to this. Um, we also do, we do family law and, and so you know, there's a whole range of family law issues that we see. Um, you know, there are certainly you know, divorces and guardianship issues and custody and visitation issues, those kind of things. Frankly, the, the family all issue that we see the most is child support arrears. Um, you know, service members or, or veterans who have passed child support orders, um, who have fallen into arrears for whatever reason, um, and now those child support arrears are really holding them back. Um, it's holding them back from getting employment, it's holding them back um, from being able to pay their rent because their wages are being garnished or their benefits are being garnished. Um, and so that's a huge issue that we see for low income veterans here in the city. Um, and then we also, you know, our practice is set up where we actually don't do VA benefits. Um, it's interesting because whenever people say, oh, what do you do? And I, I work in the Veterans Justice Project at Brooklyn Legal Services, they go, oh, so you do VA benefits. And, Absolutely not, I don't do any VA benefits whatsoever, but I have this veterans practice. Um, and our practice, you know, again, we've translated the model that we had previously to this general practice for, for veterans, and we never did veterans benefits in our office. And when we started doing this, we started partnering with other organizations, other legal services organizations in the city who already had veterans practices. Um, you know, COCO was absolutely a, a trailblazer in having this you know, legal services for veterans in the city. And so, you know, she taught us a lot and, and we're, we're absolutely grateful to her. We also, with the City Bar Justice Center, um, you know, when we met with them early on in creating this, you know, they have this practice that is solely based on service-connected disability benefits. And 
but they get a lot of veterans who are calling them who have other legal problems. And they didn't necessarily have a place to send them. And we now, in our practice, are constantly getting veterans who are calling us and saying, I've got a problem with our service connect my service connected disability. They've denied me, or I'm getting 20%, and I should get 100%, or whatever it is. And so we've partnered with the City Bar Justice Center and the Urban Justice Center um, to have this mutual referral service where you know, we're not stepping on each other's toes and we're kind of you know, um, trying to provide these comprehensive services across the city um, in a way that makes sense. Um, and, and so it's been, it's been really great working with other organizations uh, in doing this and, and, and a lot of it's actually been um, spearheaded by the Robin Hood Foundation who has their veterans initiative who funds all of our organizations in doing this work. Um, and they've also been very instrumental in helping us coordinate and working together and making sure that in the city we have these comprehensive services and that we know where to send people for the right things. And so that's been a really great part of this practice as well. Um, so, I mean, this is just kind of a list of some of the things that we do. I mean, the other nice thing is, I, you know, I'm a generalist. I've, I've been a generalist for a long time in our practice. I, you know, I primarily do housing and other benefits. Um, so public assistance, food stamps, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, SSI, those things. I don't do tax, but we have a tax law clinic in our office. I don't do foreclosure work, but we have a foreclosure prevention project in our office. And, and so what we've been able to do with the Veterans Justice Project is to leverage the other parts of our organization and make veterans a priority within our organization. And so, you know, as generally in legal services, what we have to do is kind of create a funnel, right? I mean, we have a huge city, we're a fairly small office, we have, you know, thousands and thousands of people that need our services. You know, as a matter of resources and a matter of self-preservation, unfortunately, we can't serve everybody. Um, and so, for our housing unit, for instance, we have a hotline. It's open, you know, twice a week for two hours, and then we have walk-in hours once a week for people who have eviction notices. You know, that's that funnel where we try to, you know, get the cases where we can make the biggest difference um, but also, you know, not overwhelm ourselves at the same time with the need of the community, um, which is just an unfortunate reality of, you know, a poverty law practice, I think, anywhere. Um, but I'm able, through my veterans project, to say, well, I have a veteran with a tax issue and I get to get them to kind of skip the line, right? Um, and so that's been also a nice part of being part of the larger organization that has all these resources and has all these different areas. Um, to, to serve veterans with. Um, so since we, since we started, and, and you know, I started the veterans program in Brooklyn in uh, May of 2011, so just about three years ago. Um, we launched citywide when we got some funding after that in November 2011. Um, in that time, well, we provided legal services to 3,500 veterans, their dependents, uh, and, and active duty service members as well, in all five boroughs. Um, we have a citywide hotline. We also have a great program that's focused on veterans who have student loan issues. Uh, you know, veterans are actually a real target um, for uh, educational, for-profit educational um, organizations because of the GI Bill. Uh, you know, the GI Bill, the post-9-11 GI Bill will pay in-state tuition um, for a veteran who qualifies, but if you want to go to a private university, then you know, they only pay so much and, and veterans end up taking student loans out for the balance. I'm not gonna name any names, but there's certain like online universities, you'll see those ads on the subway um, that, that and, and you'll see actually ads in the paper where they have like a set of army boots and they're like boots on the ground, you know, come into our university and they hire veterans themselves to kind of recruit other veterans to come and sign up and they take out student loans, they end up with you know, a, a degree that's sometimes useless, and then they're stuck with the student loans, and then they can't get a job that allows them to pay back those student loans. And so we see a lot of those issues. So we actually have a dedicated hotline for veterans citywide who have these student loan issues as well. 
and with that, we've been able to we were able to um, leverage some some of the private bar, you know, some volunteers from the private bar as well that helps us out with that project, which has been really great um, as well. Um, so this is what I was talking to before. So 38% housing, and you'll see the breakdown. But really, housing is the biggest need that our veterans see uh, that we see with our veterans. And so you know, we have a city light hotline, which I mentioned, but we also do on-site intake at multiple VA facilities around the city. Uh, I personally go on-site, um, I don't know the direction uh, that way, um, over at 25 Chapel Street at the Veterans Healthcare Center over there. Um, we have an attorney that goes out to the VA hospital in, in Bay Ridge here in Brooklyn as well. We have somebody that goes on-site at the Bronx VA um, hospital, somebody who goes on-site in St. Albans to the VA health facility there. Um, and so we try, you know, to meet veterans where they're at, um, to provide those services. And we have partnerships uh, with multiple veteran service organizations uh, as well um, to, you know, try to find the veterans who, who have problems and who, who need legal assistance. Um, and so this is our hotline number, uh, which is, I don't know if it's in your materials, but if you have veterans who are in need of legal services, you know, feel free uh, to refer them to us. Um, what I want to talk about substantively uh, this morning is uh, about some of the interesting issues that we have seen with veterans in our practice. Uh, because it isn't just the resources, it's also some of the protections of the programs that we found um, that, you know, opens doors for veterans, but sometimes even though there's these opportunities for veterans, there's these veterans preferences, which I'll get into in a moment, there's also some problems there, right, that we as attorneys can get involved in uh, and make a difference in, in clients' lives. Um, so uh, New York State has actually a long, long history of creating veterans' preferences where veterans could kind of get to jump the line in the same way our services are um, in, in getting certain things. And, and so we actually have active litigation in two areas right now uh, that I'd like to talk about. One is with vending licenses, and the other one is with Michelama housing. Um, I'll talk about the vending licenses first because it actually really illustrates the rich history of veterans' preferences in New York State. Um, and so under, uh, you know, you see vendors all the time on the street. They have to have certain licenses in order to, uh, to, to, to hawk their wares on the street. And there's different levels of licenses, right? Uh, there's some licenses that will just allow you to sell, you know, I, the, the joke I make is socks at the street fair, right? Because we see that all the time. Um, but then there's the higher level licenses that allow you to sell food, right? And those are the ones that are harder to get. Uh, and there's, and there's, a, there's a waiting list and you can't just go and apply for the license and get it. it it's a process and it's difficult. Uh, but veterans get special preference in getting these food vending licenses. And um, there was actually a big fight, a big hubbub recently um, in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art uptown, um, where this gentleman, Sergeant Rossi, um, had one of these special vending licenses and he set up his hot dog truck there um, and, and was selling hot dogs. And the city said, no, this is, um, you know, this, this is, belongs to the Parks Department. And we actually rent these spaces out to vendors and they charge, it was ridiculous, like $300,000 a year or something to be able to park your truck in front of the museum to sell hot dogs. I and mean, it's like prime real estate, right? Um, and Sergeant Rossi said, well, I've got this special vending license, this special veterans vending license. I could park here and I don't have to pay. Uh, and he had this huge fight with the city and, and the parks department and the museum. Uh, and he ended up winning. Um, under this law that, that basically, you know, gives veterans preference in getting licenses, but also gives them uh, the ability to, to, to park their trucks where they want. Um, and this is actually a law that dates back to the 1890s. So this was first passed, this was first, you know, went through the New York State Legislature and signed by the governor as a post-United States Civil War statute to help veterans coming back from the Civil War to give them economic opportunities, okay? And when this law was written, it said crippled veterans will be able to get these special vending licenses. And you know, the, uh, the parlance of the 1890s, crippled veterans, I guess didn't offend anybody. 
Um, nowadays, you would never say anybody was crippled, but that's what the law said. It said crippled veterans. Um, and so in the 1970s, the New York State Legislature passed this omnibus act where they looked through all of their statutes to, to kind of pick out anachronistic language and replace it with something a little more politically correct. And so they took crippled and they turned it into physically disabled. They took drunkard and turned it into alcoholic. They took you know, imbecile and turned it into mentally retarded. So that it was this omnibus sweeping act in the late 1970s where they changed all this language. And so they changed crippled to physically disabled. Well, there had been another statute that also had this language crippled. It was actually a worker's uh, compensation law where crippled children of people who were able to receive workers, who were eligible to receive workers' compensation, who were deceased, then their crippled children could collect workers' compensation. And the New York State Court of Appeals had actually read crippled before this 1970s change in the 1960s to include children who had mental disabilities. And then so when it changed from crippled to physically disabled, some children who had mental disabilities were denied um, the benefit. And so they went up to the Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals said, well, remember we read crippled to include mentally disabled children. I don't care, we don't care that you change it to physically disabled. We're gonna read physically disabled to include children who have mental limitations as well. Well, looking at our statute, the, the, the vending law statute, they changed crippled to, to, mentally disa to physically disabled. And I have a client who applied um, for a vending license who has a 70% service-connected disability rating, as we learned about this morning, based on PTSD. Um, and he applied to the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, and the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs denied his application saying that he did not have a verifiable physical disability, okay? And, and so, you know, this is a great statute. It really gives opportunities for veterans, but the way it's being applied is in a way that we believe is unfair, um, that, you know, we don't think that veterans who have physical disabilities should be treated any better or any differently than, than veterans who have uh, mental disabilities, and so we're looking for that equal protection under the law. Um, so we, right now we have a case pending against uh, the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs and New York County Supreme Court. Um, the, the memorandum of law is actually in your, your materials if you want to take a look at it. It's Nasser versus DCA. So it's, it's an interesting case. Um, and so these kind of veterans' preferences actually are kind of all over the place in New York City law. There's a lot of veterans' preferences um, for hiring for, for, for government jobs. Uh, they get you know certain points on the civil service exam, which gives them you know based on their service um, you know ad, an advantage in, in applying for for government jobs. There's also veterans preferences in housing as well, um, specifically in Mitchellama housing. So Mitchellama housing is a uh, program for for middle income New Yorkers um, that that are able to buy subsidized co-op apartments. Um, and their maintenance charges are based on income. Uh, and it's, it's great, because it's, you know, it's, public housing is great too. I mean, we need that, um, you know, makes a huge difference for low income New Yorkers, but this is, you know, this is this, a more middle class program where people could become homeowners of a co-op, uh, you know, in these great middle class developments. But the, the rub is that they're not building a lot of new ones and it's really, really hard to get into them. And so um, New York State has passed a law that says veterans, um, certain classes of veterans get a preference in housing, in applying for these uh, apartments. They get to jump to the top of the line. Uh, and so we've actually had three pieces of litigation uh, regarding this because again, you know, it's a great law, but the way it's applied isn't always best uh, in our opinion. Um, and so the first case that we had done a couple years ago was a veteran, um, Martin Boomagen, who's, there's an article, the very last thing in your uh, materials about him in the case, 
where he had, a, he had actually, his, he had lived with his mom. He was a young man when he went into the service. He was 19 years old. He was off in Iraq. His mom had applied for Mitchell Lama housing um, out by Coney Island. And um, she put on the application, it's gonna be for me and my son to live there. And my son right now is in Iraq. Can't sign the application. She listed them as both co-heads of household. Um, the developer actually did the right thing and took them and put that application to the top of the list. They provided their DD-214 and all the information they needed. He had actually, he was already a veteran because he had out of uh, high school joined the Marines, did his tour in the Marines, got discharged, became a veteran, had his DD-214, signed up for the Army. And when he was in the Army on his second tour of duty, on his second stint of service, I guess, was when the application was put in. So she provided all the stuff about him being a Marine veteran. They put him to the top of the list. They showed him the apartment. They loved the apartment. They wanted to take it. And then unfortunately, New York City uh, Housing Preservation Development, who oversaw this particular Michelama development, said, no, the veteran has to be the head of household. Nowhere in the law does it say they have to be the head of household, but they said this is how we're reading it. If you want to get this, you need to, the veteran needs to be the head of household or the spouse of the head of household. So we sued them. Um, fortunately, they settled um, and they were able to get the apartment. Um, right now, Coco and I actually have a case pending in New York County Supreme Court about a, a veteran who, and there's an article from the New York Post in your packet about this case and the brief as well. In, in Glover v. HPD, um, where um, the client had applied. It was a waiting list that there was 30,000 applications. They were only putting 2,000 people on the waiting list. And so they conducted a lottery where they picked 2,000 names out of a hat, and those 2,000 names were the ones that got on the waiting list. Well, they didn't apply the veteran's preference first. And again, there's nothing in the statute that says that there, the veterans have to go through a lottery. The statute says you have to give the veterans preference. Uh, and, and so there, we have a case pending about that. I have another case pending out of the Bronx right now as well, um, where there was an open waiting list. They closed the waiting list, and they're saying the veterans only get preference over the people on the new waiting list, not the existing waiting list. So there's problems with this that we're, that we're seeing, that we're challenging, and making sure um, veterans get you know, the, the, the best opportunities possible, because frankly, you know, they sacrificed a huge amount for us, um, you know, in service, and it's the least they deserve, um, is to, to get to the top of the list and to get, you know, the best reading of the law possible. Um, and so, uh, and, and sadly, you know, HPD, in response to this litigation, actually promulgated proposed regulations that would have inserted head of household would have inserted this lottery rule into the, a change in the regulation. So sadly, uh, and, and the city, and this is under the last administration, and I'm hoping the new administration is a little more generous with these preferences, they actually, in response to this litigation, in response to these cases, they tried to change the law to make it more restrictive. Um, we actually had, we, we gave some testimony to HBD about why they shouldn't adopt these changes. Um, and that testimony is in your materials as well. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Coco now uh, to talk about her project. Thank you. So I just wanted to talk about, uh, I'm a Brooklyn alum, um, and the reason that the project was founded, sorry. Um, so I was searching for a note topic in the Lexus lab and came across the case Veterans for Common Sense versus Peak. And um, in that case, there it's a it was a organization that was suing the VA for the delays in benefits and in mental health treatment. And I read that 18 veterans a day commit suicide and it just I mean, blew me away. Uh, and it really woke me up to this idea of my own you know, civic duty and I looked around for a place to maybe intern, volunteer. The City Bars program had started but there was nothing else. And I really think that 
New York City was really lacking behind the rest of the country in terms of serving veterans, and we've, we've stepped it up with a lot of new programs emerging. But there's still uh, a long way to go. So um, the other thing is uh, what I put in your materials is uh, the case went up through the levels, and the Ninth Circuit opinion in May of 2011 is a really fun read. It's, it's pretty just flat out unconstitutional, but uh, it's terrific for veterans advocates because it basically says the VA, the VBA, the benefit side, is a complete mess and that this is shameful. So it was, even though it was a, a loss, it was a, a great win in terms of acknowledgement of how horrifically we've been treating veterans. Uh, so today that suicide rate has only gone up. Um, and it's, the, you know, those are the VA zone numbers. It's actually probably much higher. That doesn't include, you know, uh, overdoses, a lot of, New York City, it's not a problem as much, but um, people crashing their cars on purpose. Um, we have a client who told us about driving down the highway the wrong way at night with his headlights out and says he's not suicidal. So it's definitely, you know, higher than that even. Uh, and so right now, the New York Regional Office is one of the worst in the country. Uh, the average wait for the first application is 642 days. And in that time, the rest of, you know, all the other benefits that we all work on in legal services are so important. For someone who really, truly is disabled and cannot work and is counting on their country taking care of them, because that was the promise that was made. Um, so that's where, you know, public assistance and uh, social security benefits can, can be the safety net when those veterans are waiting. Um, the other issue is that if they get denied because no one helped them put it together and they didn't, you know, they didn't, everything that Caitlin was talking about this morning about making sure you have the nexus and the proper medical evidence, then they've got to appeal. and. At the time of, uh, in 2008, the average wait was four and a half years. And now we're down to roughly 1,500 days. So it's, it's a really long time and people's lives can fall apart in the meantime. Uh, so anything that we can do as a legal community to help move that along and get people their benefits sooner is, is really terrific. Uh, and I think really shameful is the wait for um, a mental health appointment. That's the average. I want to say that New York City, I think, is, is better than the rest of the country. We have a lot of facilities and there are a lot of resources for veterans. Um, you know, Pete had listed a lot of the different VA locations around the city. So I don't want to say we're lucky, but um, compared to the rest of the country, we, we are. So. Um, yeah, so I started um, the Veteran Advocacy Project at the Urban Justice Center, and we really did all of our outreach uh, and focused on the most vulnerable population. Of course, most veterans and the veterans in this room are terrific, you know, some of the leaders in our country. But there's this other smaller population that really does need assistance. and. Um, you know, we try not to further any stereotypes, um, you know, all the issues around stigma with mental health and things like that. Um, so we don't actually, you know, we don't label that we only work with people with mental illness, but that is our focus. Uh, right now, our initiatives, we have campus outreach. Uh, we are trying to, you know, a lot of this generation's coming back using that terrific post 9-11 GI Bill. Um, the benefits don't always come on time. The certifying official at the school usually messes up, and then people face eviction. Um, or someone's having, what we've been seeing, someone has a, a tough time and they end up having to drop out of school, and suddenly they go from having $3,000 a month to live on to zero. And in New York City, that's, you, you, you're in trouble. So we've been doing a lot of outreach trying to let uh, student veterans know about all the resources that are available to them. Uh, and then we have a law student fair hearing clinic, which is currently actually supervised and run by Justine Pelham, who's in the room and is a Brooklyn student. 
Um, and the Brooklyn Law Students for Veterans Rights have volunteered for us quite a bit. Uh, so we're in the Chapel Street Clinic, which is where um, the Veterans Welfare Center, the Vet Center for Combat Veterans, um, Project Torch Homeless Intake. Pete is there um, monthly. Every other month. Monday. Every, um, and so Justine and the law students from four different schools are there to work on public benefits. And again, there are a lot of veterans who depend on those uh, while they're waiting for their benefits from the VA. And there are a lot of veterans who aren't eligible for VA services. So those public benefits have become really important. And the students take on the hearings. Uh, and then we've also launched a discharge upgrade clinic, which is something I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, these are the main areas of service. It's lovely for us uh, that Legal Services NYC exists because I can send our cases over there that we don't work on, uh, foreclosure and things like that. Um, the bulk of our practice really is VA claims. Uh, and of course we send uh, anything that would fall within the City Bar Justice Center within their scope, we send over to them so that none of us are duplicating services. Some degree. Um, child support modifications are also just a huge problem. Um, and discharge upgrades. A lot of things that we see, um, we have a lot of, especially the younger veterans who either haven't really come to terms with their own experience, don't want to have any kind of flag on their record because they want to continue their career in the military or they want to go to the FBI or <coughs> something like that. So they don't want to get treatment at the VA. So we've um, cultivated relationships with a bunch of different projects in the area. Um, the Headstrong Project is based out of Wild Cornell. Um, there's the Soldiers Project is national, actually. So there's so many, there really are so many resources that have developed in the last like five years alone for veterans in this area. And then some of our clients also, um, we don't do criminal work, but sometimes my clients still, you know, call me when they get picked up, and um, it's unfortunate because I'm kind of useless. But the VA does have what's called a VJO. It's a Veteran Justice Outreach. And they have two people who um, try to pull people and get them into veterans courts um, before they go into the criminal justice system. And it's, um, I think, there's like 260 now nationwide. Uh, the one in the Bronx just started last fall. Uh, they, they opened on Veterans Day. So every county now has one except Manhattan. So don't commit crimes in Manhattan. <laughs> Um, so what I want to talk about, because I think that um, it's really important and it's really an overlooked issue, um, are discharges. What people don't realize is that, you know, all the different benefits that we've been talking about, um, you don't have <coughs> access to them if you don't have a good discharge. So these are the five statuses, the characterization. Um, there's, I mean, there's thousands of like separation codes and all kinds of different things that go on, but these are the five basic steps. Uh, punitive means that a, it was from a court martial. Um, this is what we usually do for our clients, and these are the benefits that you can get if you have access to the VA. It's astounding. There's so much that veterans are missing out on if they don't have a good discharge. Um, here's a very oversimplified, basically in order to get the GI benefits you have to have an honorable discharge. Uh, something that's really often misunderstood, people say, well, but I was general under honorable conditions, that doesn't matter. Um, you won't get those GI benefits. And a lot of people were counting on them and they had no idea when they did whatever they did or signed off on whatever they did that this was going to basically scar them for life. Um, so something to think about is also um, other than honorable, which so we'll talk about that. So other than honorable is um, given out quite a bit. It's administrative. There are a lot of vets in the room who know more about it than me, probably. Um, it's also often used as a plea. So 
if you are about to be special court, you know, face special court martial, it's like, well, you can just sign, take the OTH, we'll get you out. It's faster, it's easier. You just want to go home to your family. You're not thinking about your future, and you do it. And there's also this huge myth that it'll automatically upgrade in six months, which just persists everywhere, and it's very frustrating. Um, but what happens is you're giving up your access to all of these benefits and services. Um, and so this, the stats that are up there, I mean, this is an area where you know, particularly people are doing FOILs and trying to get more FOIA, which is federal, um, trying to get more information on it, but there's not a whole lot. Um, a guy who is uh, from Colorado, I think it's the Colorado Springs Gazette, has done a really fantastic, I think one of the articles is actually in your packet, did, has done some fantastic work and found that, you know, in the Army, the 25% increase in misconduct that you can actually, you know, pin it to certain bases, to Fort, like Fort Carson, uh, I don't know, you know, that's one that's been in the press a lot because of all of the problems and a lot of people, that the injuries are basically <coughs> matching, the rise in injury, injuries are matching the rise in misconduct discharges. The other thing that we're going to see um, is that, you know, the Army is going to be, or the, all of the services are going to be cutting back. They need ways to trim people out. Um, you know, in the, in the case Veterans for Common Sense, there's actually, they found a memo that a doctor said, well, you're just, you're giving people these PTSD diagnoses and those we're gonna have way too many of them. Don't just put that down, like write personality disorder, because then they won't get compensated. Um, so it's not, you know, a lot of people kind of look at this situation and think, well, I served, I didn't have a problem, I made it out okay. Um, they should have, you know, they had their shot. And in fact, the, the example I always give to try to help people understand you know, why we think this is so important for advocacy, is um, someone who served in Iraq was shot in the back, um, has a bullet in his spine. He was given Oxycontin uh, for the pain. He became addicted. He then turned to illegal substances, and then he was given a bad conduct discharge because he was doing drugs, which you obviously should not be doing when you're serving. but. Um, you know, here's a Purple Heart recipient with a bullet in his spine, and he can't get treatment. And to me, that's shameful, like that, that we have turned our back on that person. Um, so that's the reason that we launched our discharge upgrade clinic, people like that who um, really need the health care. Uh, so there are three ways to go about it, uh, sort of. If you have an OTH and other than honorable, the VA is supposed to review the entirety of your service and make a characterization determination. Um, too often, vets will just go into a medical center, they open the computer file, and they're like, yeah, no, no service for you, which is wrong. Um, so we try to get the word out as much as possible that even if you've been turned away, it doesn't actually mean you're not eligible. And so we're doing those characterization of service hearings for them. Um, and then the two other avenues are the Discharge Review Board and the Board, yeah, this is that side. Um, 38 CFR 3.12 is the main um, law that, you know, that regulation that lays out all the different bars. Um, but the VA has its own internal manual and seems to, you know, make up its own rules sometimes. So we're having a hard time. We're probably going to have litigation that's going to, get beyond, um, we're hoping to get outside of the VA system essentially because within the VA system, like the Board for Veterans uh, Appeals in DC doesn't have to, like there's no precedent and it can literally rule on the exact same issue in two different ways on the same day. It doesn't matter. So they really don't want anything to get out of that administrative stuff and go up to the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Um, so the, the two boards, this is what we've started where 
um, in partnership with the New York County Lawyers Association and the Ferrick Center for Social Justice, we have put together basically just this massive pro bono clinic um, so that people can be matched with veterans and help them to work on their upgrade. And everything that you'd have to do, you know, showing the, you know, the trauma, showing why is this person, you know, what was going on with them. You know, so in the case of some, you would say, well, the army basically got him hooked on Oxycontin, he took a bullet for his country, you, you, you build a, I mean, this is not exactly a good legal argument, but to give you the sense quickly is that you build an argument around that. Um, and so this is just something we're trying to get more people to recognize uh, and hopefully help out in terms of, um, you know, a lot of our veterans just want a chance. They know that, you know, the, the approval rate right now, the last data that's available um, is 17% in the Army boards. Um, the Coast Guard's 1%. Like, this is not an easy battle. Um, the other thing that's included in your materials, the Yale Legal Services Clinic, um, which was mentioned earlier, has done amazing work in this area. They brought, so I put the complaint in there that they brought, um, and it's, there, I was just flipping through it again, and there's a line that says that their client, Frank Shepard, has been left on the battlefield for 40 years. Um, and I think that that, it's incredible. It really gets at the sense that these discharges follow you for life. It's a, it's a personal thing. It's, um, you know, we do have guys who come in and they're like, I just really want benefits. But for most people, this is deeply personal. It is about their identity. Um, it, it helps, I mean, it hurts when they're trying to get a job. The rest of their life, they have to, and if you have a, you know, there may be a narrative reason for separation that says personality disorder. So imagine having to go apply for a job and having someone see that. Um, so that's sort of, you know, that's, that's the lighter end, you know, that it hurts when getting a job. Um, feeling left behind, feeling that you were betrayed, basically, by this, you served for your country, and then, you, were, you know, it's kind of, it's slap in the face, to say the least. So, uh, that's all. And on that cheery note. <laughs> so. I have a question about the discharge upgrade, because that seems such a big issue and one that's getting a lot of attention. How does that issue change or vary depending on the type of veteran uh, we're talking about? Like, so are, are discharge upgrades different, say, for a Vietnam veteran, where we're talking about trying to reconstruct facts from a long time ago, uh, versus uh, an Iraq or Afghanistan veteran? Um, are they, is, is, say, PTSD something that was not something anyone recognized, say, in Vietnam, uh, a, a different question when it comes to uh, discharge upgrades that, than a more recent one. Well, so you really should be asking Yale. <laughs> but, um, they are, so the, the case, uh, the Shepard case, they actually settled last fall, but they're rebringing it um, and working on this because of the fact that the, the term PTSD did not exist during Vietnam. Um, so it's a, it's a different struggle, I would say. Um, there's also, you know, every branch is different. Um, the Navy has a zero tolerance policy. Uh, it depends on what board you're going to. You know, if you're going to a DRB, Discharge Review Board, you, and you have a bad conduct discharge, it can only be, uh, they can only upgrade on the basis of clemency. So, um, you know, I would actually defer to <laughs> someone who has more expertise than me, but it's really, you know, the one, the one area where there is, you know, Yale's working on the, the PTSD in Vietnam class action, and then the other area that's really ripe for a class action is, you know, this group of people who are given personality disorders or adjustment disorder instead of PTSD, and there are 30,000 of them, so. Is the character of discharge something that matters at all in, say, um, 
vendor licenses or any of the other um, preferences? Yeah, I mean, Coco's really cool, like, yeah. appearing benefits chart that you put on. <laughs> you know, it's like you can get public assistance in food stamps and Medicare, but look at all these things. That's on there. And it's not even, you know, so the, the mitchell Lama regulations and the vending license regulations actually both reference the the preferences for hiring for government jobs. So they, it's all internally referential um, and the standards the same and, and you need an honorable discharge. Um, and in addition to that, the other programs I talked about like the S Supportive Services for Veterans Family, which is this grant program to help for eviction prevention. And it's not a government benefit, but it's funded through the VA, administered by local nonprofits you need an honorable discharge. So really, almost all doors are closed um, for anything that's veteran specific. Um, housing programs, uh, you know, one of the things that I had actually failed to mention in my presentation that I'd, I'd like to just say a quick word about is that there are other housing programs beyond grant programs. There are housing opportunities for veterans. A huge one is the HUD-VASH program. Um, which is a partnership between HUD and the VA um, to provide Section 8 vouchers um, for veterans. And so Section 8 vouchers, for those that don't know, uh, is a housing voucher where you pay a share of the rent based on your income. So generally you pay 30% of your income as your share of the rent, and then the local housing authority pays the balance. Um, and so in a city like New York where rents are so high, it, it makes it affordable. Uh, it, you know, and, and the standard, you know, th thought has always been that you should pay about 30% of your income as your shelter. Um, and that's, you know, where the poverty level measures and all these things come from. Um, and, and, and so, so that's a program that's out there. There's also, and again, you wouldn't be eligible with bad discharge. Um, there's also a, a program called Grants and Per Diem. Um, which is, a, again, another VA-funded program that's subcontracted out to, to local community-based organizations um, that provides transitional housing um, for veterans who were homeless. Uh, it provides them you know, an apartment for an 18-month to 24-month period uh, to get back on their feet, get employment, and then find permanent housing. Um, we've actually had, unfortunately, some litigation about that as well, um, where uh, you know, the VA will say, well, this person's not eligible um, and pull the funding and then the program thinks that they could just throw these veterans out on the street. Um, when in fact, you know, as a tenant in New York City who's been in an apartment for more than 30 days, there's no self-help eviction available. And, and, and landlords, even if they're completely in the right and even if they're a nonprofit and even if they're government funded through the VA, still have to avail themselves of the court process and still have to hire a city marshal. Uh, and so we actually have a case and the report decision is in your packet as well, McCormick uh, versus Resurrection Homes, or is just one of these programs um, that was funded through the VA grants and per diem program. The VA pulled the funding on this client, on this veteran, and the program just went, and she went home actually to, to Maryland to visit her mom over Thanksgiving break and she came back and her doors were locked. Um, and so she had to file an illegal eviction action in New York City uh, Housing Court, and you know they wouldn't even settle. That we had to have a full trial, and the decision was after trial that restored her back to possession. Um, so as much as again, you know, like the Mitchell Lama, like the licenses, there's great programs out there, but there's problems with them, uh, and 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 people need lawyers to protect their rights in these programs. Yeah, and the the el just to clarify the eligibility for HUD Vash. Uh, vouchers, which is like the golden ticket for a veteran, is you have to be eligible for VA health care. That's what it states in the regulation, which is that OTH category, which is why characterization of service determinations are so important. Um, unfortunately, the VA then sends a letter to the veteran when they make their decision that either says honorable or dishonorable. So imagine getting a letter that says your service was dishonorable. You know, on top of it, it's, it's traumatizing. Um, but those those determinations are so important because it gives you access to all of these benefits. So we we have some time for questions, uh, Commissioner Hahn. Yeah, just quickly, Coco. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen um, 
I haven't, we haven't fielded any phone calls from individuals who were issued um, less, uh, uh, less than honorable discharges for homosexuality, don't ask, don't tell. Did the, um, the DOD come out with some type of policy where they were gonna review these things and, and just change them without a big deal or whatever? Yeah, so it's easy to get them changed. I think that what becomes tricky is if there's also misconduct that's alleged. Um, but there's a bill right now pending that would make it sort of this automated process to get them upgraded. But yeah, we actually, um, I don't think we've gotten a single call on yeah, DADT. I, I which is um, hopefully a good sign. <laughs> and and Congo, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't it, those were not dishonorable discharges, right? They were general? It's a whole right. Range, right? It would have been a whole range of discharges. Right, that, and that's what, it, I mean, if it was just, you know, it actually, I think, says homosexuality as the narrative reason. Right. Um, if it was just that, it would be a general. In the misconduct, in the misconduct, Yeah, and that confuses it because if someone also did, you know, if they had a few NJPs, it, it, it then, you know, can make the issue blurrier, I would say. But so far, um, we haven't gotten any calls, and we have a really long wait list, uh, which is not good. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your presentations uh, today. A uh, quick question, with all these different benefits uh, that are available and all the different things, are you seeing any special um, situations for uh, women veterans that might be kind of uh, outside uh, what we've seen in the past with both uh, disability compensation and other things or possible trends uh, because there are so many more women serving? I, 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 would, I wouldn't say there's specific problems with the benefits, I would say there's specific problems maybe with the programs. Uh, and l let me explain. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, as much as there are more women serving, there's, there, it's, it's still a smaller percentage than men. Um, and, and so, so many of these programs are, you know, even if they are not geared just towards men, they're dominated by men. And I think a lot of women you know, and I'm, I'm thinking really housing opportunities, um, transitional housing or, or, you know, supportive housing, whatever it is, there are, you know, a lot of women who may have been uh, victims of military sexual trauma um, are, don't want to live in situations that, that there are men living there as well. Um, they also, a lot of them are disillusioned with the VA uh, and, and, and don't feel welcome there. Um, and, and so, you know, I think there needs to be more um, programs, housing programs, health programs that are, you know, single sex female programs to, to make female veterans more comfortable. Um, those are the kind of issues that we see. Yeah, I, I would just add, I mean, the homelessness rate among female veterans is skyrocketing because of some of the reasons I think that Pete was talking about. But we also, you know, DHS is a huge, pro uh, Department of Homeless Services mm -hmm. in New York City is a huge problem because, um, you know, I think someone mentioned it on the first panel, there are, even though proportionally women suffer from military sexual trauma at higher rates, the number of assaults are actually even, they're equal in, in number. Um, so a lot of our male clients as well have suffered and don't want to go live in a dorm style shelter and find that really traumatizing and trying to get DHS to cooperate and work with them is pretty hard. Let me just say a quick word also about just homelessness and veterans and, and DHS and how to fashion how the, all these things interact and just the, the trends of things because you know President Obama and General Shinseki made this pledge to end veteran homelessness by 2015, right? And we're, we're, we're really close to 2015 at this point. Um, and, the, you know, that was some years back. And, and they've actually made tremendous strides. And, and so HUD-VASH has been a huge part of that. And um, also the SSVF program has, has been a huge part of that. And now for this coming year as the last year of this and to get this done, they're actually putting some surge money into SSVF to kind of, you know, make that last push to try to end it. 
But frankly, you know, and this plays into Coco's whole thing with the discharge upgrades is, you know, a really good way to end veterans' homelessness is to say these people aren't veterans. Um, by, you know, giving them these, you know, it is only veterans who count as homeless if they have the discharges that they are considering to be veterans for. The legal, the legal status as a veteran. Right. I and mean, the government actually says these people are not veterans. Right. And so if, you know, if you give somebody a bad discharge and they're homeless on the street, they don't count as a homeless veteran. I just wanted to ask you, and thank you for your efforts and everything you do, is depending on newspaper reports or TV reports, it just seems to me, just beyond belief, that there are still 1,500 days, which is still four years, uh, to wait for an appeal, or 360, 700 days to wait for an application. In your opinion, only your opinion, is it bureaucracy? Is it ineptness? Is it lack of funding? And there's a case I we just heard a couple of weeks ago that somebody had so many backups in one of the offices, they just threw them away. That's they burned the way the to records. With that. Yeah. In California, they canceled veterans' uh, CMP exams and burned the records so that no one would find out. Like, and the fact that that wasn't on the front page of every, I mean, it's outrageous. <laughs> Absolutely outrageous. Um, this is a very political question, so I'll try to. Uh, yeah, and I, 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 I get a little emotional. Um, <laughs> but there are a lot of different. So, one view uh, some people try to say that, um, you know, this. The VSOs like American Legion, VFW, the older ones who worked so hard to, on the Agent Orange issue, that, that, that these claims are really all about Agent Orange and that's created this huge backlog. Um, I don't personally think, you know, that I think they weren't ready. I think that we sent, we started wars and we budgeted for those wars and not for when people come home. Um, and so, there's not enough people. There are too many claims. I, I think that it's, you know, that's my lay opinion. With reference to the uh, Veterans Court, with reference to the Veterans Court that you referred to, uh, if someone, if, if the, uh, a veteran appears before a court, that would be the criminal court first and the uh, charge is not a felony, and it's not violent, he would be entitled to go before the Veterans Court, uh, and they have special remedies for him. Do the criminal court ju judges inquire of a person appearing before them whether they are a veteran before they assign counsel, and if not, don't you think maybe the Bar Association should speak to the administration and have that as one of the first questions to be asked? Do you think, do you think that could be done? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And well, I, I think this actually, this plays into what I was saying before about asking the question, are you a veteran? And the courts do, and we have actually representatives from the Brooklyn Veterans Treatment Court in the room today. Um, who could answer this more confidently. I actually, I love the Veterans Treatment Court. I, I sit on the advisory committee for the Brooklyn Veterans Treatment Court. It's a great program. Um, but I know, I, I think OCA is now screening every person who goes through the system, right? Yes, we've asked that that does would happen. You, would you it doesn't you? always happen. Yeah, would would yourself, you introduce yourself? Um, sure. My name is Elon Robin. I actually coordinate the Brooklyn Veterans Treatment Court. Mm -hmm. um, and we have Judge Brennan and Judge Ferdinand to help out with that. Um, and, we've, and they've done great work and made great strides um, asking other judges and in other parts of courts to ask your clients, ask the people in front of you if they have served, um, not if they're a veteran, ask if they have served. We do accept anybody regardless of their discharge. Um, it doesn't always happen. And these, uh, you know, individuals who are veterans don't always say that they are a veteran. So we, we really do try to intercede at all different levels. But that comes from, too, if you can ask your clients if they've ever served, because we do have these additional services for them. And while I have the mic, if there's <laughs> anybody here who is a veteran and is interested, we do have a mentor program. Um, 
If you're interested in volunteering and being there for our veterans who are going through the court process, um, it's a great opportunity to give back and, and help out, and you can come talk to us after, and we'll give you more information. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Just, just real quick, one of the, uh, the problems that we've run into, that I've run into since I've come on board is the Veterans Commission. We don't ask whether people serve or not. And when you get into the veterans courts, and I'm familiar with Brooklyn, they're phenomenal. Queens is phenomenal. Brooklyn is, uh, and Bronx is off to a really great start. During the arraignment process, somebody's got to raise that question, okay? And like any process that we have, things just fall through the cracks. So if everybody on each side, okay, if they're going through the arraignment process, if somebody doesn't ask that question, then the bar Okay, the bar in each of the counties. Everybody should be saying, hey, my count, this, this thing fits the, the profile for a veterans court, and they should make certain that that question is asked before they get far down the track. I found that when we run into problems in any borough, including Manhattan, that I've made a phone call to the places where we've had uh, treatment courts, that somehow they've been able to work something out where we could move it over or do something else like that. But hopefully, Everybody's going to do it, but we just have to ask the question whether it's on the uh, prosecutor or the defense side. Of it. Everybody's got to know that this is something they can do. That is not the answer. I understand what it should be done. And the, and the, the prosecutor, mostly, I think anyone who's had any kind of experience knows that they're interested in the prosecution. They're not going to ask the question. As to whether you're talking about the charge. Right? And I'm saying I think the criminal court judge should be the one to ask the question because some of them may be very clear in the process. That's a, that's a great point. I think. <clears throat> Uh, part of the idea is everybody should be maybe asking that question that maybe help what happens. And, and I don't think it's just a solidity criminal. Frankly, if, you know, I mean, in my area of practice, if housing court judges ask, are you or anybody in your, your family served or is a veteran, then that may open opportunities for, for referrals and resources that wouldn't be there. Um, and, and so I think, you know, throughout the system, civil criminal, you know, out of court, we should all be asking the question, are you a veteran? And one encouraging okay. sign, I had an assistant DA in Brooklyn email me last week um, asking about treatment programs for, for future cases. So I was like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> so we have time for one last question. Yes. Um, my question is, what is the actual procedure for appealing a less than honorable discharge? 